thank you, Mark, for being here. It's a pleasure to be able to interview you. Um, I would like to uh, understand uh, your experience with the, uh, the medical cannabis uh, in Canada. So how was the challenges to, to approve in Canada medical cannabis? I think for Canada, you have to remember that it's been a very long process for the uh, authorization of cannabis for medical purposes. It began with patients challenging the government to change the law to allow cannabis, and then a, a series of changes to the law took place which allowed patients to buy cannabis from a producer, uh, to be able to grow their own cannabis, to be able to designate somebody else to grow it for them, uh, and then there was an increase in the number of producers that were allowed to grow cannabis. And then they were allowed to sell uh, not just dried flowers, but oils. Um, so at the moment in Canada, it's a very big and comprehensive program. But it, fundamentally, it still needs a physician or a nurse practitioner, but mostly physicians, to sign a document that authorizes the patient to possess cannabis. Once they have the document, they can go and register with any one of, I think as of yesterday, there were 111 companies growing cannabis and producing fresh flowers, dried flowers, or oils. So the challenge is the physician having the ability to write and sign an authorization. Do they have the knowledge? Do they understand enough about cannabis and safety and efficacy? The second thing is the patients choosing which of these companies which product to use, whether the high CBD, high THC oils. Um, there's no pharmacy to help them make the decision, so the company is forming the decision. Um, and of course, there's a lack of research and clinical trials to inform the whole process. So it's practically a very powerful program. There are over 300,000 patients in Canada. Over 11,000 physicians have authorized, but we still have a long way to go. Beautiful. Uh, in your experience, uh, what type of pain uh, medical cannabis is more effective? So I, I'll speak to two things. One is the clinical trial experience, which strongly suggests that pain of neuropathic origin, so pain caused by a damage or disease of the nervous system. And you can think of the peripheral nervous system like diabetes or uh, herpes, shingles, uh, infection, post herpetic neuralgia, or central neuropathic pain, so multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injury. These are the best studied conditions for medical cannabis. Uh, in particular, THC like products can have CB1 and receptor agonists. Um, and there are some suggestions that. Diseases like fibromyalgia and generalized low, low back pain may also respond, but the evidence isn't very strong, um, and it's also probably because of the central changes in the nervous system why they may respond to cannabinoids. Um, having said that, that's the clinical trial data. In the clinic, I think I see a, a wide range of different pain syndromes responding to cannabis, um, and it's often not necessarily just the pain itself, uh, it's the chronic pain, like they've had pain for a very long time, and they have anxiety and poor sleep. And this combination of symptoms, uh, more than just the pain itself, makes them, I think, likely to respond to cannabinoids. Perfect. Uh, in your experience with patients using CBD or THC or the combination, which one do you think is better for chronic pain? Again, the evidence would suggest that THC is the one that's been the best studied, and simply because CBD has not really been studied for humans with pain very much. Mm -hmm. So we know THC has been shown to have some analgesic efficacy. Um, in the clinic, we're beginning to understand and to learn from patients that CBD may be important. In particular, patients who are on high doses of opioids mm -hmm. and they're in pain and they're taking high dose opioids and they're still not responding, um, they seem to be, and this is just anecdotal information right now, but it's interesting to note that they seem to be responding well to CBD and they're able to reduce their opioids. 
there's some information on cannabidiol being in animal models useful for treating certain kinds of pain. Mm -hmm. We don't have anything in the clinic yet. So this is an interesting signal that we're hearing and learning from our patients and I think we need to do more study on that. Perfect. Well, so this will be my next question. In your experience with patients using the opioids, uh, medications, medical cannabis can really affect positively the treatment and what do you see? So we see patients on opioids uh, who respond to cannabis when they initiate cannabis therapies um, being able to reduce their opioids, sometimes very, very rapidly oh. and sometimes faster than I would want them to. If I was advising them in the clinic, mm -hmm. I would have them slowly do this carefully. Mm -hmm. They come back two weeks later saying, I've stopped everything. Surprise, and you know, I think maybe that's they have to be very careful. But we hear this happening, mm -hmm. um, and it's not just me, many other clinicians are, are beginning to see this happen. Um, I think there's no question in my mind that it's a, it's a real phenomenon. Patients are able to do this, but we don't yet know which patient. Is there a particular kind of patient or a type of opioid or a combination that we have to treat best? We don't know how to initiate the cannabis therapy and at the same time how to taper the opioid down. We need protocols mm -hmm. to say, start at this dose, mm -hmm. after so much time, you know, reduce the opioid dose by this percentage. And those protocols then need to be validated and shown to be safe. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to do this in a different range of pain situations so that we can tell which type it might be most useful for. We don't have that. We know that in the animal models that there's a very good synergy between opioids and cannabinoids. They work well together. Mm -hmm. um, we know from big public, public population-based health studies that when you have medical cannabis in the U.S. states where there's a legal cannabis, they use less opioids, they're spending money less on prescriptions and so on. So we have that level, but we don't have the clinical, you as a patient, me as the doctor saying, okay, here's some cannabinoid, here's how to start it, here's how to reduce your, we, yeah, we don't have that level of information, but we need to start doing something. Yeah, it's true. Um, which side effects do you see more frequently in your patients using medical cannabis? I like to say the most common side effects are the, the three Ds, dizziness, mm -hmm. drowsiness, mm -hmm. and dry mouth. Okay. Uh, and, and those in multiple studies come up as the most common. And those are the acute side effects. So if I've just used cannabis, mouth gets a bit dry, I might feel a little bit lightheaded, and uh, I might feel sleepy. Mm -hmm. Dizziness, drowsiness, dry mouth. Um, there are some unusual side effects that I think are uncommon but deserve attention. The hyperemesis, the nausea that some mm -hmm. patients seem to get. Yeah. We know cannabis can be used to treat nausea, but for some reason some people get mm -hmm. very, very profound vomiting called the cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. This is intriguing. Some people obviously if they take too much cannabis or too much THC, uh, they can get very anxious, paranoid, and uh, it's a very unpleasant reaction. Mm -hmm. So patients have to use low doses, be very careful. Um, and then of course there are the uh, chronic effects. So if you've been taking cannabis for a long period of time, what are the kinds of uh, effects that you need to look out for in terms of lung health if you smoke or vaporize, in terms of um, cognitive function, does it impair your ability to remember things in the long term? And I think this is something that we need more work on mm -hmm. at this time. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. It was really amazing to talk to you. Thank you very thank much, you. Paula. Thank you.